football game. I'm at the grocery store. What? I'm at the combination football game and grocery store. Wait, you're at the football game What? and the grocery store? Nah. I'm at the combination football game and grocery store. Groceries through Instacart, delivered to my door. I don't have to choose between football and the grocery store. Jim Bruton, The In-Between, A Trip of a Lifetime, a near-death story. And we kind of covered this in, in uh, previous conversations. But when this happened to you, you're at the peak. I think you've done all sorts of things that you really wanted to do. You've excelled. You've got an Emmy. You've created a technology that we are using now, thanks to you, that improves our ability to transmit stories globally. And so you're part and parcel of all of this. And yet, at some point, you had a checklist. You had to go back to the source and say, okay, did that, now what? And a reminder, without telling you what you were going to do, that this was still on your plate. That's so cool. Maybe it wasn't to well, you. <laughs> it, it, well, like I, like I said, maybe it was just the next step in my personal evolution, having checked so many of the other things off the list, you know? And, I, uh, and I'm very grateful for the opportunity. I mean, if any of us at any time during the day can say something or do something, that lifts someone else up, even an inch. It's wonderful. I mean, the word educate doesn't mean I'm going to put knowledge in your head. It means to draw forth. And back in the day that the word was created, the teacher's role uh, was to say to their students, all truth and all beauty already exist within you. My role as your educator is to draw forth from you what is already there, to remind you of what you already know. Imagine waking up in a world like that. Yes. How much respect is inherent in that viewpoint already from the get-go? That's how we can talk with each other. That's how we can treat each other. And, and, and when we really uh, do wake up in that world and we talk to people in terms of their highest potential, our body language, our nuance, our inflection, our choice of words, our the light in our eyes, everything says that for that moment, that person is talking to someone who believes in them, who is calling that highest out of themselves. And guess what? One day you're going to realize that maybe you're the only person in that person's life who ever did that. On that day, you may have made a real difference, and now they can make a difference. Well, you see that with children who've been abused or who've been discounted or in some way demoralized, you know, shamed, and then some person comes into their life and says, you can do this. Why can't you do this? Everybody else does. You can too. You just haven't been given the opportunity. And those kinds of things, then you see people make tremendous life shifts. And it's because all of a sudden somebody says, you have permission, you know? Exactly. Exactly. And, and that's what we should That's what we should be doing every day for each other, whether someone appears to need it or not. We don't know what's going on in their inner world, but everybody can probably use a little bit of a lift every day. And we can do it without any effort. It costs us nothing, and we have nothing to lose. Okay, so you were 1.0, the old gym, with the alcohol, the cigars, and the fast lifestyle, and the, the high, 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 as in higher, higher, higher for the... Um, it, it's it's almost it's an excitement, an adrenaline rush that you were pushing the envelope to see just how far you could go. Mount Everest, you know, how many times do you need to go there? Um, the, the <laughs> because it was fun. <laughs> Five years in a row. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, poor thing. Poor thing. Okay. But there's that addiction to uh, the adrenaline rush of doing something different, doing something unexpected and unplanned and uncharted. It's always new. It's always fresh. It's always exciting. And so to go from that to being able to sit six hours solid doing absolutely zero zilch, nothing, that is a huge 2.0. Where did that come from? How does that integrate? Because a lot of people, that's, that's a, uh, a mind blow to say that all of a sudden you don't need those extras and you're satisfied and content with standing still. You, you asked a great question. And it's really it's hard for me to actually speak to how, how that happens. All I can say is that it certainly makes for challenges with your relationships. You know, <laughs> like my wife came in and <clears throat> pretty much said, gosh, you look like my spouse, but you know, who's this person? Because yeah. you're different in so many ways. And, and you know it down to your core because you react to things, even new things differently than the old person. And uh, honestly, when we were in marriage counseling one time, she was like 
missing some of my, what she called bad habits. And my therapist laughed and said, yeah, they're not all that bad. Um, you know, she started to um, become more stressful about the changes in me since the crash. Yeah. And ultimately I, I had to say, you know, the, the person before died in the crash, this is what you have left. And there's no going back. There's only building a new. And that's it. And, and honestly, to put a really sharp point on it, our marriage vows say till death do us part. What happens when one of us dies? No matter that we return. Our covenant is broken. The only reason we stay together now is simply because we choose to. Well, and that is a huge, huge message because that's one of those after effects. And it really is true. All of a sudden, the desires, the values, the goals, the things that you find joyful in life aren't the same as what you built a relationship on. When you're having a camaraderie, you're laughing at the same jokes, you're looking at the same events as saying, I want to go here. And the other person saying, not really, not really. And so that's a huge challenge that people have, not only with your spouse, but with your relationships with friends, with coworkers, with people who knew you before. And these are parts and parcel of the things that have to be unpacked when an experiencer comes back and says, where do I go from here? Because what you have now, you still, you value in some ways even more, but you don't want to lose or diminish the people who got you to where you are because they still in some way shape or form had a part of putting the bricks in place that you walked on to get to this point but how do you let them know that I still love you I still care I just need to do different things for us to be together and that's where the that's where it falls whether you can go beyond that or not. And I'm glad that you're also including that in your story because I think that's a crucial part that sometimes gets overlooked as to what happens with relationships after these kinds of experiences because they do shift. You know, you're, you're so right there. And, you know, it, it's one thing if we just talk about near-death experiences in terms of, again, how beautiful they can be as experiences and then all the wonderful say, psychic abilities or, you know, things that we come back or to humorously talk about the after effects, like, hey, we blow light bulbs up all the time, things like that. But I think there is a, there is a, there is a cost and there is a price to this experience. And, you know, certainly some of it is wrapped up in our redefining ourselves based upon the different people we realize we are now. And some of it definitely will come at the cost of relationships that we were comfortable with, but you know, they, it's, it's like, even though we could say we didn't consciously choose to have this path, new path in front of us, right. we can certainly say that those who didn't experience didn't choose it. So yeah. if they can't pull on, it really doesn't come down to, you know, good and bad people. It just comes down to overwhelmed people. And it's totally understandable if within a marriage or a formally committed relationship, one decides they just cannot walk that path at this time. And that's okay. That's okay. You have to let them go um, and love them. And you have to be true to yourself just as they have to be true to themselves. And some of this has to do with each person. And you got to see yours. Not everybody gets to go see the in-between and all the nuts and bolts of what's happening and what might happen and all the possibilities. Obviously, this was something that, in, in terms of you going forward, is a, is a crucial part of your journey. So the person who's with you now is going, I don't really want to know the end. I don't want to know the nuts and bolts. I don't want to know the in-between. I want to know how we get to the park on Sunday with all of our friends and bringing the cake and who's going to, you know, all that. All of a sudden, they're right here in the manifest plane where all of this is super, super hyper real. And you're in the expanded plane where all of this down here is a bunch of ants. <laughs> well, that's kind of how it is. And, and you know, you can't go back and they know they don't know how to go forward. So sometimes you can come to an impasse in terms of your traveling time together. And honestly, as you start to realize how you've been removed from the crowd, um, you know, obviously we're still human as well. And, and we, we aren't, well, we can, we can be solitary. We can be by ourselves, but obviously where we might look for some validation, we'll start to redefine our relationships. And a natural place is to start to do research online and, and discover things like the International Association of Near-Death Studies or the Near-Death Experience Research Foundation. Read other people's accounts. You'll probably find, maybe if you're lucky, one or two that are similar to yours. You might even be able to reach out to those people 
and start to form relationships. You can go to local meetings or conferences and find other people. And in my first uh, international conference for IAM, it was really interesting to walk around and see all these strangers looking at each other, and yet there was a hint of recognition in their eyes. And then all of a sudden, people are sitting down on couches or in the corners of restaurants sharing um, very intimate details about their lives. And I think, like you were alluding to before, what happens next? That's the first question you ask in the integration process, which follows. And I think some people said it goes seven to 10 years of your life. I think it goes on to your last breath. And that's what all of these discussions were about, you know, talking about um, how easy, you know, how easily, not that often, or how much challenge there is to integrate it into their everyday lives and how they've worked to do that. Like you were saying, changing jobs. Sometimes you have to change your relationships. Things that you want to authentically make more reflective of who you are as a changed person. Yeah. Yeah. My job, describe, uh, the things I'm looking for now have no relationship to what I looked for, you know, 20, 30 years ago. It's just completely different. And my expectations of myself, of all of that are different. And so um, it doesn't mean you let yourself off the hook. It just means that there are certain things that you find more important to focus on. And it might not meet what society's expectations or their definition of success. All of a sudden, those things are completely off the table. And with this, you know, when I'm looking at you saying your next book is going to be the practice of the in-between, I think that's what you said. Was it the practice of the in-between? The practice in-between. Yeah. The okay. art of letting go. These, these things change people. And I think I think more of us are are being able to be exposed and learn that it's actually in some way, shape, or form improving the relationships because they're more authentic. There's less degree of of, of trying to hide behind a facade. Here's what here's what it is because, like you say, as you as you become more real in your relationship, you'll also become more authentic in a way that says, okay, um, before. I might have been the kind of person who had been attracted to someone who I thought was, you know, beautiful and I wanted to possess that. Or they may have been very successful in the world and I wanted to have more of that in my life and things like this. But when the day comes that you essentially, you, you, you don't want to be lonely, but you're also not pursuing relationships because of a transactional attitude, you know, what can you do for me? Right. Then you're much more open in how you come together. And to me, best I understand it, that is the solution to codependency. Yes, yes, because you want the person for what they bring to the equation in themselves, that they are happy, they're content, they love what they're doing or who they are, not because of, well, I don't have that, so I want that, and I can walk beside it and look like I have it, even though I don't have to do anything about it. It's like, wait, 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 so wait. What, so what do you think that would do to our 53% divorce rate if people approach relationships like that? Well, they would, yeah, yeah, that would be a, a tad different. They'd have different mentality, but you know, society all sets that up. Do you, you know, that's this is, this is a flip flop for society because those things are set out as goals. Find someone who's rich. Find someone who's gorgeous. Find someone who has a car. Find someone who has a house. You know, all instead of finding someone who's truthful, find someone who's, well, who's you know, kind. <laughs> right. Well, that's a big part of the the letting go portion of the book that's coming up and that's you know we're always chasing after the one more thing i need the one more car i need the one more suit i need the one more degree i need the one more uh higher status job whatever to get to where i need to go and you know what we'll be chasing the one more thing with our last breath when we go and the only people who will profit are the people who are selling the one more thing yes but <laughs> once we realize you know what when we hold a baby we're holding someone usually usually I'm saying we're holding someone right there who has all the secrets in the universe to being a happy spiritual being. Yeah. What the heck happens along yeah. the way? You know, puberty happens. Now we want to conform. We want to connect. We don't want to, you know, if, if we're um, a young woman in a math class, we may not want to, you know, show up the boy we're interested mm -hmm. in by being right. smarter. So we keep quiet. And it's like, ah, you just want to shake everybody and say, snap out of it. Come on. Everybody needs to best, be the best they can. And we need to cheerlead each other on. But when we're when we're chasing these one more things, it's it's this attitude that we're never good enough, that we have to keep, you know, jumping through somebody's hoop in order to be good enough. But the day we can start to let go of that and say, No, I have everything I need right now is a really good part of the attitude of letting go. I yes, you know, we don't need one more thing to have a near death experience. 
we don't need one more thing to have a spiritually transformative experience. And as the in-between told me, it's not a place you go to or come from. It's a place you are. So our goal should always be to keep at least one foot in that world. Okay, last question. The paranormal element. Uh, you, you, okay, the light bulbs thing. What about computers? Are, are, you, are you dangerous around electronics? Yes. Um, I, yeah. I had a uh, feeling. Computers yeah. Connect- yeah, computers act wonky. Uh, I've blown up my entire HVAC system in my home, including four of the five damper motors in the ductwork um, with a power surge. Uh-huh. Blew up my mom's transformer outside her house with a power surge. And I asked, you know, how often is that? But she says, never. And then she tried to call her friend on her copper wire phone, the kind that never go down. And the phone suddenly went dead for five minutes and nobody could use it. And those never go down. Mm-hmm. Um Electronic communications, when I was 20 minutes outside of PMH's house on my first visit, a fr- an NDE friend of mine <clears throat> texted me uh, through Facebook Messenger on my phone, which I was using for my GPS navigation. And she said, I don't know what I'm thinking of. You know, I said, because I'm 20 minutes away from PMH's house. And then while she's texting her next thing, and you can see the little dot, dot, dots indicating she's typing, my text field suddenly filled in on its own. Yeah, my hands are on the steering wheel. There is no radio on with dictation mode engaged. It's totally silent. My car is in the engine noise. And my text field filled in saying, thank you for being a kind and loving person. I love now, that. that yes. Yeah, where they, some, someone said, I guess your spirit guides know how to use your phone. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I told PMH yes. this, and she said, oh, this is just the beginning. It really has. A PMH and I have become very, very good friends. And uh, she, she really is my, my mentor in many ways and my go-to on other things. And she's just a wonderful, you know, prolific NDE researcher. Yes. Can't say enough good about her. Yes, tons and tons of energy. And so fantastic that she does have that because that's uh, – people need resources. They need hope. They need some kind of connection that says this is not fiction. This is real. These things happen. And they are natural, normal but you do have to be aware that when you blow out somebody's transformer and their power is done and they have to have a thousand dollar re- reconnect bill that, okay, um, there's an extent <laughs> to some of the fallout from these experiences. But I think that's where we're going as a, as a species. I do think that these things are part of our evolution. And this is just uh, a little like a, a warning note, a little thing of, okay, get ready, get ready. Cause three point. I, w- I want to cool. support what you're saying. I want to support what you're saying with a huge statement. To me, this is is the second coming. Yeah. That's what this is. It will be as much by having it come through us as individuals with our own individual connections and paths with God and each other. It's no less a paradigm buster as the first coming mm-hmm. in its own way. Yeah, and I think we should treat it that way, and we should look at it as positive uh, as we can. Oh yes. Yes, your experience, I think, was straight on in terms of not giving you too many things to connect to there and saying, okay, this is a desolate landscape. Now I've got your full attention, don't I? (laughs) Wink, wink. (laughs) I am the egg. I am the egg. (laughs) Exactly. Just enough ambiguity to stretch and feel stretched to the max, but now the dots are connecting. And it's like we've said before, you know, you don't have to be perfect to have a perfecting experience you don't have to have already been somewhere to be pointed in the right direction of where to go now you just have to walk that path and and you know if other people can walk with you for a little while it's great okay so the next book is coming out when i'm working on it now i i'm my target goal is to have it ready to go into editing at the end of august and they'll need about four weeks so i would say in the fourth quarter of this year it should be out uh, as well as the audio and uh, ebook version. Okay. So to get up to speed, if you're listening now, the in between, a trip of a lifetime, Jim Bruton, and you'll find out where he has been and all the extraordinary life experiences he had before the card flipped over and he became 2.0. Uh, 2.0. Whoops, there. 2. Point oil. <laughs> 2. Point oil and water. <laughs> And shake, yeah, right. shake well. Uh, so one way or the other, though, th- this, I think, is a fantastic journey. I think three is on the way. It's just a matter of, of you getting this one. And then as the uh, electrical components start to really ramp up, we're looking at a really exciting next 
generation, the 3.0. I, I have no idea where you're going from here, but what I do hope is that you will provide visuals and, um, and have a few more chats with that cigar and your, and your, your source and say, how can I ramp this up? Because people are waiting for the rest of the story. I'm, I'm planning on heading out right now after we're done. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Watch for the electrical storms. You'll know where he is. Jim Bruton, thank you for talking <laughs> with me. And uh, safe travels and, and keep the stories coming. Thank you, Wendy. It's been great. Uh, thank you for your time today. And thank you to all of your listeners who joined us. And the website for Jim is inbetweenproductions.com. Check it out. Thanks for listening. I'm at the football game. I'm at the grocery store. What? I'm at the combination football game and grocery store. Wait, you're at the football game what? and the grocery store? Nah. I'm at the combination football game and grocery store. Groceries through Instacart delivered to my door. I don't have to choose between football and the grocery store. 